Good evening to all the dignitaries, faculty members, and all the attendees, along with our eminent guest and international expert, Prof. Professor Garupa. I would like to extend a warm welcome to everyone on behalf of GNLU Center for Law and Economics to the fourth GNLU workshop on economic analysis of crime and constitutional law. Spanning from 2nd of August 2023 and 8th to 10th of August 2023. This workshop will not only aim to foster research and learning interests, but will also provide the participants with tools and techniques in the study of law and economics. Without any further ado, I take this opportunity to invite Dr. Jagdish Chandra, Registrar Gujarat National Law University, to start the session with the opening address. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Nino Guru Gurupa, Professor uh, Honorable Director Professor Shanti Kumar in absentia, uh, Center Head uh, Professor Rajinta Nagar, uh, Convener of this program Dr. Hitesh Tucker, and other faculty members present here, and the student uh, members of the center, all the participants who joined this uh, workshop. So, firstly, I welcome all of you for this fourth JNL workshop on economic analysis of crime and constitutional law. Uh, if, I, if I want to talk about this uh, special workshop, which has been the fourth edition, very, very important, I wanted to mention. Because the uh, Center for uh, Economic, cent the center actually, right from the beginning, I will keep on observing the each workshop participate in terms of participation, in terms of quality, in terms of inviting resource persons are, uh, you, can, you can see the best, the best possible resource person are inviting. So today also Professor uh, Ninu Gopa invited as an eminent speaker for this international expert was invited for this uh, inaugural session. So I'm very happy. And at the same time, I also would like to, the, whoever has registered, I, on behalf of Gujarat National University, I would like to uh, thank them because it is very, very important area, which is especially for law students, it is required to know. Everything you say, you, you talk about policy matter, you talk about any uh, application of any law, if you talk about any implementation of law, whether it is really working or not. Economic analysis, tools of economics is always very, very important. Even it is whether it, whether it is a crime or whether it is a motor vehicle accident, whether it is a civil cases, criminal cases, our implementation of constitutional spirit of any of the law, the economic analysis of law of that important area plays a very significant important role. Why it is important? Because we are, it, is, it is dealing with the human beings especially. So we are all, any law is a solution. A law is a solution for people problems. I have to, a, what is called as handle particular situation. So therefore, <clears throat> there, without the economic uh, tools, uh, anything law cannot be improved to the extent of dealing with human beings. So that is the reason. So if you apply the tools of economics for any law, any law subject, effectively, we can improve the existing system of society, existing system in the lawmaking process, which is always uh, the ultimate solution is we, we give the delivery of goods in a most effective manner for the people of this country or any other country for that matter. So therefore, this kind of workshops, whatever the center is organizing, whether it's a conference or a workshop or any other programs they're organizing it, it is beneficial for whoever is participating. The thinking will change. The way they think law will definitely change because there is an important tool is there again to take up and then make more effective. So therefore, it will help all of them to make uh, the existing society more friendly, more very, very uh, effective in terms of implementation. So with this, so this workshop of long duration is 2nd August to 8th to 8th August 2023, the whole long duration of this workshop will definitely benefit all the participants in understanding, especially crime and constitutional law, they are picking two important, very important area. So as a student of law, uh, analysis of uh, uh, economic analysis of constitutional law is very, very challenging in fact, <laughs> because we're experimenting 
implementation of constitutional fundamental rights are DPSP principles right from 1950, 1947, then the Constitution 26 January 2000, 1950. See, since then, one, so many amendments were moved from time to time. I think all of us are aware of it. And uh, now those amendments has come, some from the Supreme Court observation from leading judgments, some from uh, people struggle from time to time. So uh, some from demand from particular community or a religion, those amendments were moved. Some were actually politicians, of course, vision and to make it more constitutional, more effective. In addition to that, so economics uh, tools to take up and then analyzing constitutional identity, it's really very, very challenging in fact. Uh, what articles they will take up, how to analyze it, I am also very, very eagerly uh, waiting to see that experts lecture if I time permits definitely I'll also join and see uh, because apart from we always look at constitution in cases okay constitution provision this is a case it's that way but okay, bringing economics into constitution is very very challenging that is one thing crime definitely I know because as a student of criminal law having interaction with Professor Rangdhanagar Madam many times when I was started teaching at the initial days of my joining <laughs> A uh, lot of IPC crimes, provisions, uh, we discussed it, Madam told many things about uh, economics tools, how it will be useful for criminal, criminal law side, but constitution I was really very much curious to know, that is one thing, but whatever it is, the efforts are very, very sincere from the center, uh, members and head of the center and other uh, it is, sir, many other faculty members, the efforts are very, very sincere that I could see. They never stop despite of anything comes. They have very clear mandate every year what is to be done and they'll make it possible in a very, very grand manner, very effective manner. That is what I really like the approach of the center. So with this, so thank you so much and the congratulations to all the participants who joined for this course because you will get a lot of insight from the eminent experts of uh, who can deal with this economic tools and also law. They can inter integrate between both that, both of them. So you'll definitely see a lot of uh, inputs and uh, it is going to be a big uh, uh, change, what's called game changer in our life in terms of thinking process. So with this, I'll end up. Thank you so much for inviting. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for that warming address. Now I take this opportunity to invite Professor Dr. Anita Nagar, the center head for Center for Thank you, Khyati. On economics and guidance to address all of us. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Khyati. Uh, good evening, uh, one and all. Um, uh, respected uh, registrar in charge, uh, Dr. Jagdish Chandra sir. Respected uh, my con co -co my convener of uh, member of the Center for Law and Economics and convener of this program, Dr. Thakkar. Um, the TRA in charge, um, Ayush, uh, student members, uh, Kathy and um, Sarangsh. Uh, in the, at the outset, I need to say that whatever has been possible from the Center for Law and Economics has been under the auspices of this university. Uh, over a very, very long time, we've had the best of uh, encouragement from all the uh, you know previous director professor uh, bimal and patel and the present director uh, dr santo kumar and of course the, all the administrative uh, support that has been in place so that is one uh, jagdish sir uh, i will also add that the contribution made by Dr. Hitesh Thakkar, along this long, long, long journey is irreplaceable and invaluable completely. Uh, and of course, the contribution made by all the younger members of the team, including the students. In fact, students have been the highest motivators and the torchbearers of the work that we've done. Um, Professor Nanu Garupa is also associated with us for the last uh, at least 10 years, Dr. Thakkar, if I'm not wrong, uh, in multiple conferences. He's an authority on it on his own. I'm sure you've all gone through the quantum and the quality of work that he has done. That itself is an inspiration. 
uh, he is a um, of course uh, he's a he's a he's a dual jd and an expert in both the studies of law and economics on top of that he's an expert in um, mathematical and uh, econometric analysis statistics and mathematics so you know when you read his papers uh, you do see a lot of uh, you know uh, i mean it, it at least in india it doesn't look a paper on law because there is so much of advanced uh, calculations that uh, take place so we are he'll be joining us uh, because we've you know taken so much of his time from morning we are going to take three four hours of his time so he'll be joining us and um, uh, and 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 we are very very thankful to him not just for this course but for the continuous association what i found uh, what i want to tell all the participants is this uh, <clears throat> yes and uh, you know not new anymore in india but when we started it it was new and at that point of time of course now i don't know there are at least three four national law universities who have this particular uh, course uh, in the law firms, there is, uh, you know, uh, law firms, it is the commercial interest. So, therefore, the provisions of the law have to be understood in terms of its commercial uh, implications, you know, in terms of uh, the, the incentives and disincentives that the laws carry with it. So, there is a huge appreciation of this subject as far as the practicing commercial world is concerned. So, for, the, for all the participants, this is an important input. For research, if you see the best journals, you will see that, uh, you know, very real concepts and uh, have to be taken in and uh, variables have to be identified, which can lend themselves to very robust uh, statistical analysis to give good outcomes. So, mostly law with regard to its impact analysis. If you see the best journals, you will see those kind of papers. So, that is for the budding researchers. For the um, you know practicing world for the uh, lawyers, um, very strong and very convincing arguments can be emanated from the pure logic of economics, uh, which adds to the clarity of the uh, provision of the law. So there is huge takeaways from this particular uh, you know uh, domain from this uh, area of expertise, and. Um, um, when uh, Jagdish sir uh, pointed out that, you know, economic analysis of constitution, how does one look at it? Uh, well, uh, we look at the constitution as, uh, it's not my session, but just two minutes. <laughs> we look at the constitution as one of the most elaborate and most efficient uh, mechanization for competition. If you understand the constitution and we see its uh, features, if you see separation of power. So, in economics, a good market is where you do not have monopoly. You have the competition uh, commission to ensure that there is no monopoly in the market because monopolies are adverse for the consumers. In the constitution, when you have separation of powers, it is to ensure that there is no monopoly of one particular agency. So that there is, uh, so that the whole idea of rights of the citizens can be protected. So that, that is one, separation of powers. Federalism is again an aspect of the constitution which uh, allows more of a federal competitive framework rather than a unitary monopolized framework. So, every feature of the constitution, if we identify, we will see that it is advocating the provisions are to ensure um, at least not, you know, the growth or the accumulation of power at any single point and there are multiple agencies which can be approached by people in order to address the same. So, that's one very, very elementary idea of the constitution. I mean, students of law and professors of law will be able to identify many more uh, such provisions. And, and more importantly is that 
uh, when there's this contentious issues that are being discussed, especially if you, from the context of the constitution as we see today, there are very, very content, contentious issues, you know, for example, should some words be in the preamble or not, so on and so forth. So that can be discussed from either a very passionate point of view, emotional point of view, or from a very scientific, logical point of view. So from an economic analysis, you would want to see whether the preamble creates economic value for the citizens of the country and distributes that value equally rather than uh, whether it emanates from some ism or from some belief or some passion. So all the more, when there are such contentious issues, should researchers and students not have the tools to be able to very objectively scientifically measure evaluate and give a measurement to what happens if you keep a word in or you take away the word what are the costs and benefits of uh, those particular attributes of the constitution so that would be another important level at which we want to advocate for uh, objective secular scientific analysis of uh, of any area of law including the constitution so since I said this is not my session, this is Honorable Professor Garupa Sir's session. So what I will do at this point of time is ask uh, Dr. Thakkar to tell us something maybe about the course or or, or just something about the center uh, till the time. I always give him the difficult work. So till the time Professor Garupa joins us, uh, he should be now uh, doing at any moment. So just a few minutes maybe to Dr. Thakkar. So, firstly, uh, on behalf of uh, GNU Center for Law and Economics, we are very much thankful to our, uh, director, uh, our director, Professor Santa Kumasa, for the guiding us and helping us to uh, motiv motivating us to organize a uh, 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 centered activity. And he always uh, help us and he always assist and guide us to how to further better in the CLE. And uh, in in that regard, what the administrative uh, part, whatever the requirements are there, I think I think we are very simple to uh, research. I think it's like just telling and completing. I think is uh, like Madam was talking about efficiency. So I feel that he complete the administrative task of whatever thing has to be done. I think in in that regard. So we are very much thankful to sir for uh, allowing us to uh, do program in a more efficient manner. Oh, I think Garupa sir has come, but I will just take uh, five minutes. Uh, uh. You hear me? Good morning. Can you hear me? Okay, very me? much time. Yeah, so you're, you're already but you're clearly already. Okay. Mr. Garupa, just give me a We're minute. also thankful for so the... Yes, Dr. Thakkar, please continue. Yeah, so we're also thankful to our resource person uh, Nanu Garupas, I think uh, he's a guiding for Center for Law and Economics. I think uh, he, he guides us in many of the activities. Is there some, some voice, uh, voice is breaking, Just see internet is connectivity. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Is my voice audible? Yeah, your voice, your voice is, is clear. Yes. Yes. I don't know why. My voice breaking. Is it still breaking? Is it yes. still breaking? It's fine now. Yes, yes, it's breaking. It's still breaking, yes. So I think we can start with the Garupa, sir. I think I think we can discuss that thing at later stage. Okay, okay. Yeah, madam, so you can take off take from just, here. Yeah, I'll just take over. Uh, Professor Garupa, uh, warm, warm, warm welcome to you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have taken so much of your time. I mean, I don't know what to say. Uh, so, uh, I mean, let me introduce you to Dr. Jagdish Chandra. He is the registrar in charge of the university. And, uh, you know, uh, we asked him to officially. Sir, sir, thank you so much for joining. Uh, joining. So, thank you very much for your time. Madam was telling since, you know, you're associated with the center since almost 10 years and you're giving so much of time for the university. We are very much thankful to you, sir. And also, whenever I know today, also. I know you're given this time and madam was telling since morning madam was keep on troubling you in fact many times so i'm very much thankful to you on behalf of university sir thank you so much for joining 
you. Thank you for having me. Um, pleasure, sir. Well, it's our pleasure. Um, are we supposed to start? It's you know. Um, Usually yeah. I'm, I'm from I'm from a country where um, Portugal, where we are always late. Um, but here, I think we are three minutes before the time. So are we supposed to, to start before the time or what do you want to do? No, we'll start on time. And okay. so I'll just, I'll just take the last three minutes to also, uh, you know, Dr. Thakkar, uh, you mm -hmm. met him. I mean, you communicated with him. Um, we have uh, our very young, um, uh, you know, um, uh, teaching and research uh, associates in the university with our center. So, Mr. Ayush, uh, Mr. Vivek, and we have uh, our very enthusiastic and very, very brilliant uh, students with us. That is Kathy and Saranj. And of course, we have this, uh, you know, <clears throat> participants. Uh, you have a registration of 53 students. The composition is 50% uh, would be practitioners and 50% would be students. 50% would be from, I think, outside our university. 50% is our own uh, university students. So that's the composition. And I took two minutes to tell you that so that you know, we know at what level we pitch the uh, sessions. So on that note, uh, we will still, I think, have two minutes. So. There's nothing more to say, and the floor is yours, Professor Garupa, uh, with a huge thank you note from the beginning, and we will conclude it with the same. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you, you, should, you should not anticipate how you're going to conclude, because it depends on how the session goes. So, um, uh, we, we, have, uh, we have sufficient prior experience. I know, I know. Yes, but I could be smart and just do everything okay every, all the time until time T, as you know, in game theory, the last period, and then I will do the mistake. Um, and, and that's part of, of, of what the things we want to talk a little bit today is, is um, a bit how, and I'll, 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 I'll come to that a bit later, how far uh, people are rational in 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 committing violations of the law because that's that's so, sort of a subject of what we have to talk about so let me let me sort of um sort of go over um some of the issues here um, so, is... so, so i'm sorry i'll interrupt please mute yourself uh yes thank you so please go on yes um so i i i, I want to talk a little bit about um how we come to the economics of crime and criminal law and what are the issues. And in this session today, um, I, I do not want to speak for two hours. So I, I am going to ask questions to the students at some point uh, because I don't want to be speaking for two hours. Uh, so just don't run away because there will be questions at some point for you. Um, and some of these questions are going to be sort of, you know, um, going over the examples in Kutter and Yulin, which is sort of what I'm going to follow for this session with some, you know, uh, degrees of, of freedom in the way I approach uh, their two chapters on criminal law. But I think the first comment is um, a lot. I mean, there are two basically distinct discussions in, in law and economics concerning crime. One is a more theoretical discussion is why do people do these things and how should we design criminal law uh, after understanding how people decide to, you know, violate the law? The second is a, a big issue in the last 20 years. It's the econometrics. Of this and I, in the next session, I do want to talk a little bit about the econometrics. This has been an issue in the United States, in Europe, but also in India. There's a growing number of studies and um, the, the big problem, uh, for those of you who are not very familiar with the kind of metrics, is that the big problem is that um, sanctions influence crime rates, but crime rates also influence sanctions. And so you have a problem that it goes both ways. So the simplistic studies in the 1970s, where you run crime rates as a function of sanctions, and that's essentially the early 
Ehrlich's papers in 73 and 75 at the American Economic Review and other journal, top journals, they were very naive because they did not understand that uh, you couldn't do that. You have to look for instrumental variables or some other mechanism to identify um, the effects of, of sanctions in crime rights. So the initial papers were not just wrong in terms of econometrics, they overestimated this effect to a, to a large extent. Um, of course, it started the whole issue about the deterrent effect of the death penalty, which still is ongoing. Uh, there's still a lot of studies going in different directions. But since the last 10 years, we had a lot of developments in identification, uh, experiments, um, new econometric strategies, and so the field has changed dramatically. And if you pick the top journals in the US, there's so many papers on crime now, on trying to identify how sanctions impact crime, but also how demographics impacts crime and a lot of other um, issues. It's a very controversial area. There is sort of a lack of consensus about um, what are the right and the wrong policies. And it's a very politicized, uh, obviously, area where people have very different ideas based on their presumptions about, you know, policies and ideologies. Um, one aspect I, I do want to emphasize is um, that outside of one economics and outside of economics in particular, um, a lot of people have trouble with the approach that criminals could be rational actors. That is, that criminals would do some sort of cost-benefit analysis and then violate the law when the benefit outweighs the cost. We'll come back to this with details. Uh, first, looking at the traditional model, the Beckerian model, which is a rational model, and then looking at the critiques. Um, Tom Ulan has a very um, uh, cited, important cited article on this with Richard McAdams, where he tries to go over the behavioral uh, aspects and why this is problematic. I have my own article about 20 years now where I'm much less enthusiastic of behavioral economics. I still think it's um, not totally clear to me that we should step down from the rational model and just embrace this behavioral law and economics. The reason is the behavioral law and economics does not really have a model. They basically have a, you know, objections to the rational model. They have a set of things that obviously are correct from experiments that people have all these shortcomings, but it's not clear what they're proposing as an alternative model to make you know, rigorous predictions about how people are going to react to certain policies. But there's a discussion there, and, and you know, if you guys have an interest, you should read these papers where they have different viewpoints and view on what we should be doing there. Now, one, one, one aspect I want to start um, is um, for, for, for people who are coming from more the law side, is a couple of, of important remarks. Um, first, when we talk about the Beckerian model, the 1968 paper in the Journal of Political Economy, um, it talks about crimes, but in a non-technical way. Uh, in fact, what it's talking about is uh, not complying with the law. Uh, is not strictly talking about what we call crimes in criminal law. Of course, cr crimes are an example of not complying with the law, but of course, it includes any sort of regulatory uh, misbehavior, any sort of behavior that is subject to some sort of punishment by the state. And of course, this is not necessarily crimes as we understand them in criminal law. So regulation, and regulatory violations are included in the model. The reason why I'm saying this is because um, the usual examples that the Becker uses, which is you know um, traffic and car parking and compliance with 
you know, you're not supposed to cheating in an exam, for example. All of these things, of course, are not crimes, technically, right? I mean, they're just, you know, violations of regulations. And so I want to make it clear from the beginning, particularly for those coming from the law side, that we'll be using the word crime in a very broad sense and not necessarily in the narrow sense of, of criminal law as we know it. The second uh, issue is we have to understand why Becker's contribution was so important. Um, because if you think about as an economist, what he's saying is essentially two things. First, people do cost-benefit analysis. So everyone is a potential criminal. Everyone is someone who is potentially violating the law. The difference between the true criminals and most of us is that we do not commit crimes because the cost outweighs the benefit to us, whereas those criminals are people for who the benefit outweighs the cost. And so in, in his view, this everyone is a potential criminal. The difference we have is that the equation of cost benefits for some of us are uh, make us good citizens and for other people makes them bad citizens. Now we'll come back to this, but this is not particularly um, insightful because this means all of us uh, under his model are potential murderers and potential criminals and potential everything. So if you pick the Beckerian model, uh, the only reason you, why you're not shooting people today is because the benefit of shooting people uh, is not enough to compensate your cost of shooting people. It's not because you have some, you know, grounded moral values as, as we'll come back to this, as for example, Kuter in 84, in his critique of Becker, he makes this point that um, there is a set of social norms um, and a set of inculcated values. And therefore, unlike Becker, Kuter argues that sanctions are not prices. In fact, the article is called Sanctions Are Not Prices. A sanction is not the price you pay for doing the crime as in the Beckerian model. A sanction reflects a prohibition that wants to suppress your behavior. And so that the logic of Kuter is quite different from the logic of Becker. The second issue that Becker puts on the table is essentially that um, punishment is expensive. Now we have to hire police, we have to have jails, we have to have courts, we have due process. This is expensive. So the implication is we are not going, it's not efficient to have zero crime rates because a zero crime rate would be extremely expensive to implement. So an important point is there's going to be a policy that looks at the marginal benefit of deterrence and at the marginal cost. And the marginal cost includes the criminal justice system. And as long as the criminal justice system is expensive, we do not want zero crime rates. We will have some sort of positive crime rate. And if you're simplistic as an economist, you would say it will be the rate at which the marginal benefit of deterrence equals the marginal cost of deterrence, obviously. But this is intuitive. Now, immediately some people, particularly sociology and the law, jump at the economists saying, oh my God, you are saying that there is an optimal number of murders and an optimal number of rapes and an optimal number of all these awful things and that we should not be trying to suppress them. And the answer is, well, if you think the marginal benefit of deterring these actions is close to infinite, is close to a large number, then of course you'd be saying the optimal rate is zero. But you have to sort of argue that the optimal number, the, 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 the marginal benefit is huge. Now, clearly that's not what we see in most societies. 
because most societies allocate resources to the criminal justice system, but they do not allocate resources to the point of suppressing crime. So clearly, uh, from a positive perspective, it does not seem that our societies think that the marginal benefit of deterrence is huge to the point of ignoring the costs. However, from a normative perspective, that is from the viewpoint of uh, uh, efficiency discussion, I do think that there's an argument, if you want to make it, that for certain crimes or certain actions, the marginal benefit could potentially be so huge that you would want to allocate more and more resources to its deterrence. So, the argument made by economists is not inconsistent with the normative valuations by sociologists or by lawyers. It's just a question of where you put the argument. Um, now, you have to realize the importance of these insights from Becker in 1968. And this has to do with the context of the 1960s and the 1970s. In the 1960s, sociology and criminology of crime moved away from the deterrence model to what was called back then the victim's model. That is, the criminal is a victim of society, and this is about bad socialization, bad social conditions, and so the policy should be about rehabilitation, should not be about deterrence. And that was sort of where the paradigm was in the 1960s. Now, what Becker introduces in 1968 is the classical argument of deterrence that the sociologists had abandoned by then, saying, well, there might be rehabilitation, obviously, but there is a question of deterrence. We want to deter certain actions, and the way to deter is through sanctions. There is, of course, another argument, which is incapacitation. You may want to say, well, not only I want to deter, I want to incapacitate. Capacitation is a different argument. It's not the argument that you're deterring people, you're just imprisoning people that potentially would commit more crimes in the future. This is not about rehabilitation. This is not changing their preferences. Notice that a rehabilitation argument is an argument about changing preferences. This is not an argument about retribution. This is not about saying these are bad people, I want them in jail because they did things very bad in the past. Because you cannot change these things anymore. And in fact, retribution would be something that economists would have a hard time to explain why we waste time with retribution. It's costly and does not change the past. So the argument has to be incapacitation, looking into the future and saying, the reason why I put these people in jail is because they are potentially bad people. I don't want them outside, so I put them in jail to incapacitate them for future crimes. Now notice how this argument is different from the deterrence argument. The deterrence argument is about a policy that deters individuals from doing something in the future. Capacitation essentially incapacitates them, does not deter, simply does not give them the opportunity to do it. And so you could explain, you, want, you may want to explain the imprisonment as incapacitation as deterrence, but they're different arguments and the economic calculation is going to be quite different. Because the economic calculation in incapacitation is about the extent to which a certain individual is likely to commit crimes in the future. You have to argue that these people are very likely to commit crimes in the future. Deterrence is an argument of if I put people in jail, other people, other people are going to be deterred because they see if I do a crime, I go to jail, I don't want that, therefore I'm deterred. So these are Different. Incapacitation is an individual argument. It's about you have to argue that certain individuals are potential criminals in the future. Deterrence is a general argument. It's the argument that if I punish these individuals, other individuals, the general public, 
will be deterred. Why am I emphasizing this? Because it, you know, it sounds like, okay, a nitty gritty detail. Why do we care about this? Because when we go into the empirics of this, when we start having an empirical discussion, it's going to be very important to understand if our policies are incapacitating or are deterring people. And many times it's not easy to understand, right? If you put people in jail and you see the crime rate going down, you don't know if this is because you put the bad people in jail, that's an incapacitation argument, or if because people are scared and see that they go to jail if they commit crimes and therefore they are deterred. These are different arguments and they have different policy implications. And it's not easy uh, to um, understand them. In particular, notice the deterrence argument, which is what Becker is talking about. It's a very difficult argument to make uh, empirically, and that's why this is such a problem for the econometrics, because you have what's called, people call it the, the tiger fallacy. Now, I, I'm clearly in DC, so I'm pretty sure there's no tiger uh, in my room, but I, I know there, is, uh, there, are, there are tigers in, in Southern Asia. And the question is, why don't you see a tiger next to you right now? Right. I'm assuming most of you don't have a tiger. I mean, many people don't have the camera on, but I think they don't have tigers next to them. So why don't you see a tiger next to you? And there are two possible explanations. One explanation is that the tiger doesn't exist in the first place to be next to you. The second explanation is that you have been so tough with the tiger that the tiger is afraid to come into your room. That's why you don't see a tiger in your room, right? So the first explanation is simple. There's no tiger to start with. And the second is there could be a tiger, but you took the appropriate policies to deter the tiger to come to your room. And you don't know which is which. And why is this a problem? Because when you study crime and you don't see crime, you don't know if you don't see crime because there are no criminals in the first place, which would be an incapacitation argument, or if you don't see crime because the criminals are deterred, which would be a deterrence argument. And so this is the tiger fallacy. You don't really, you cannot really observe what's going on with the tiger. You cannot really observe if the problem is that we have arrested all the criminals, all the tigers, or if we have deterred all criminals, that is, all tigers. And you will need some sophisticated techniques to do this. And this is going to be quite important if you want to do policy. But so bottom, so bottom line, we make a distinction between incapacitation and deterrence, and we have to keep this distinction if we want to understand these policies. Now, as I said, this is quite different from the classic argument for uh, rehabilitation that was very popular in the 1960s and the 1970s. And that's why from the beginning, there's a clash between the sociologists and the economists. Because in a way, why don't economists like the rehabilitation argument and prefer the, the deterrence argument? Because the rehabilitation argument has a component that the economists in the room will clearly relate to. It means changing preferences. And economics is not a good science to explain why people change preferences, right? I mean, we are very good science to explain, given your preferences, what should be your optimal decisions? It's a decision theory. We have wonderful decision theories. Now, why do you change your preferences? We don't really have an economic theory for why you change your preferences. I mean, we have Becker's own rational addiction model. 
we have had some dynamic preferences trying to explain these things, but we don't have a good grasp of why people change their preferences. And so psychology and sociology are more likely to be better social scientists to do that. And so rehabilitation for us is a problem because it would demand economists to explain why people change their preferences. And we don't really have a good theory. Right? And, and, and of course, it would be tautological to say, well, uh, why were you a criminal in your past? Because your benefits outweighed your costs. Why are you not a criminal now? Because the benefits do not outweigh the costs anymore. How do you go from one to the other? Oh, it's just the benefits changing. Well, that's sort of tautological. It's not very interesting and it's not really a falsifiable theory. So we don't really have a good theory for why would people change preferences, right? Why would people not have certain social norms? And then because they go to jail or because they do some sort of, you know, rehabilitation program, whatever, they change their attitudes and change their understanding of social norms. We, we don't really know that. And so I think that's why rehabilitation is not really a very sound economic theory. We prefer determinants, we prefer incapacitation. And so that's where we were with Becker in, in 68. Now, there's sort of two or three different ways to go on this. Economists have done a lot of work criticizing Becker, and, and I will explain a bit of that, but that's because Becker was a very simplistic model. Then you have a lot of people in sociology and criminolo criminology criticizing the economists because of the rational choice assumption. I'll go back to that. That's the behavioral sort of discussion. And then you have sort of the critiques to the policy implications, right? Now, Obviously, the sort of law and order agenda, the more conservative agenda on um, crime, talks about deterrence and emphasizes deterrence. And so, of course, they usually cite the Beckers and the Beckerian model as a support for the law and order agenda. But, of course, that's sort of a misperception or a misreading of what we're saying. Because we're saying that deterrence, tough sanctions, severe sanctions, are only efficient if indeed they deter people at the lower cost. And it's not clear in many of these policies that's what's being done. So we have to understand that, yes, we would say severe sanctions are efficient under the Becker model. But we need to understand the costs of the sanctions and the efficiency, I mean, the implications in terms of deterrence of these sanctions. Therefore, when people say, under the Becker model, the death penalty is efficient, that's certainly not true. And that's a, a misreading of the 1968 article. Because in order to make that argument, we will have to prove two things. First, that the death penalty has a significant deterrent effect. So that's controversy one. It's not clear from the data. Second, even if it has a deterrent effect, we need to show it's cost effective. Now, in the example of the US, it's clearly not cost effective because if people have to spend 20 years on waiting for the execution and are subject to all sort of new appeals and de novo reviews, this is an extremely expensive process, extremely high burden on taxpayers. It's not likely to be efficient from a cost uh, benefit. So we have to put things in perspective and understand what we're saying rather than misusing our concepts. Before I go on, any, any questions on this sort of introduction notes? No? Okay, so let me let me talk a little bit more and then I'll I'll I'll, I'll go over 
and I will sort of throw to the students the cases posed by by Tom Ulan in his book. So before we go there, one 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 point that Becker emphasized, and I do think it's the most relevant issue here, it's the distinction between probability and severity of punishment. So as an economist, Becker sort of saw the most intuitive aspect of all of this, that sanctions are not uh, likely, are not imposed with probability one, right? I mean, even if you commit a crime, the probability of detection is not one. In fact, it's quite low. Uh, even for, you know, homicide, murder, where you have a body, and so you would expect detection to be quite high. It's not. In the US, it's around 40%. So that's not a very high probability of detection. Of course, if you have witnesses, if you do it in the middle of uh, the plaza in the main street, of course, you're going to get detected with probability one. But the average probability is 40%. That's not very high. If you think of tax evasion, and non-compliance with taxes. In the United States, they calculate the probability of detection on average is about three to 5%. That's a very low probability. So that means about 90 to 95%, more than 90, 95% of the people who evade taxes do not actually get detected. Now, again, if your salary is from the university, uh, and you decide not to declare to the IRS, the probability of detection is one. Uh, but of course, if you run a business like uh, some coffee shop uh, and you say everything has to be paid in cash, then yes, you know, the probability of cheating on taxes and being caught is probably close to zero. Unless you're dumb enough to do electronic receipts or something like that. But if everything is on cash and you fake your accounting, I think the probability of getting detected is actually not very high. Now, why is this important? Because as economists, we know that people respond to probabilities in different ways, depending on if you're risk averse, risk neutral, and risk lovers. And so suddenly, the sanctions matter, but the probability of getting those sanctions also matters. Because if you're risk neutral, you only care about the expected value, right? And I, I think I've, I've done this for so many years now uh, that I believe this. So when I'm thinking of, you know, speeding, not paying my parking, or of these things, uh, you know, the calculation you do mentally is sort of an expected value. Okay, this is $150 fine. Is there any police around? Not really. So the probability is quite low. Ah, let's do it. It's not going to be a big problem. Um, yes, uh, I usually do not think of murdering someone in the in these terms, and I hope you don't. In terms of, oh, let me think probability uh, times punishment. That's not what we do for those sort of things. But for, for, for minor violations, I think it's reasonable to argue that people are sort of risk neutral. But in many areas, they're not, they're risk averse. And so then you can play with the probability and the punishment. And what Becker was trying to argue is that what is really expensive is the probability, not the severity. Because the probability is where you have to make investments for police, for technology, for detection, for due process, for courts, for trials, where sanctions, uh, well, yes, prison can be expensive, but fines are actually not very expensive. And so his argument was, then we should have a system that's based on very severe sanctions, fines, we should be fined all the time, and the probability would be low, right? So his example is um, is late for an exam, 
legal parking in Hyde Park in Chicago. For those of you who have been there, you know that's not a very nice, nice area, nice, not very nice neighborhood of Chicago. It was not in the 1970s for sure. Now it's much better, but they still shoot people occasionally there. But in the 1970s, it was a very dangerous neighborhood. And so his argument in the paper is, what should I do? Should I stop, park my car in front of the, of the economics department and get a fine? Or should I park seven blocks away, uh, maybe not very safe, and I'll be late for my exam? And the argument he makes is, well, the fine is expensive. I'll have, I'll have to pay $250 if I get fined. But the probability it's a Saturday morning, the probability that someone will show up is very low. So he ends up parking in front of the law school and not getting a fine. But his argument then is that's the sort of system we should have is a system where you have a very high fine, but to be honest, people will monitor parking a few days a year randomly. And the idea is that if you get one of those days, bad luck, you get fined, a very high fine, but most of the time you'll get away with it because there will not be any fine. And if this is well-designed, um, then people would be deterred. So the other example is the subway. Um, should you pay your ticket in the subway? Well, if the system is well calibrated, the policy should be, if anyone gets caught without a ticket, you pay a million dollars as a fine. But we only look at tickets one morning a year randomly, right? So we have one morning a year, we choose, we go there, and anyone we get on that morning without a ticket, they have a million dollars fine. This would be sort of the backer ideal system. Now, before we get into why we don't see this, and I'll, uh, that's what economists have been criticizing, right? We don't see this in real life. You do not get fined a million dollars or $10 million for not having a ticket or for speeding, uh, and there are good reasons for that. But let's see the logic here. The logic is the probability is expensive. The fine is not so expensive. So the fine should be taken to a very high value because it doesn't really increase the marginal cost of this policy. But the probability should be as low as possible. Because every time you increase the probability, you increase marginal costs. And so that's why the Beckerian policy is about low probability, high fines, as economists say. Right. Now, and, and to be honest, I, I think there are situations where this should be, right? I mean, I, I, I don't know you have been following uh, some of the scandals in the American universities in the last uh, four or five months, but I, you know, by coincidence or not, a lot of academics, uh, we have now five to 10 people, 10 professors caught cheating with data, right? They made up data. So their papers are basically false. They made up data, they invent data, and they, they publish the top journals saying, we have this data showing the results that everyone likes. Now, unfortunately, a lot of this data is fake. It doesn't exist. So one big scandal is about cheating, how you can be deterred from cheating if you have to sign a declaration of honor. Well, unfortunately, the studies showing this are all faked. The data does not show that, and they change the data to do that. Now, this is an example of a violation of ethics and professional behavior. What should be the policy? Well, we know the probability of detection is very low because how do you know people are cheating on data? We don't know. It, it needs some auditing. It needs some co-author to be furious and mad and then talk about it. 
he needs some sort of unraveling. It's very low probability. In fact, some of these papers have been published for 10 and 15 years, which means it took a long time for someone to say, this is a cheating paper. So if the probability of detection is very low, according to the Becker model, we should have a very tough punishment. Right? And, and that's what you would expect the universities to do to these professors is basically fire them because they have cheated on their research. Unfortunately, things are not that easy because there, as you know, there's due process and there are other legal complications when people are tenured. But essentially, it's an example of the Beckerian insight. If you're going to have a very low probability, you need to have a very severe punishment or this will widespread and become a more general phenomena because people are not deterred. And so this insight is a very important insight. The idea that we need to think about the probability and the severity, and the idea that you should have a low punishment, a, a low probability, because the probability is expensive, but you at the same time do not want to have uh, a low severity, because if, you, if punishment is low, then of course uh, you're not going to deter. Okay, so let me, this is a general overview, and I'll come back later to argue why some of these issues get complicated. But before we go there, let me sort of open on my end here the questions that, um, that would, okay. So I'm going to read, because I don't know how many of you have Kutter and Yulen in front of you, but this is an example. Um, Jim Blogs, okay, I'm reading. Jim Blogs, uh, hang on, I lost it. Jim Blogs is convicted of assault for striking and breaking the nose of Joe Potatoes. As punishment, the judge has discretion to choose a fine or a jail sentence. If the judge believes that each punishment would deter crime equally, which punishment should the judge use? So a stiff fine or a short jail sentence deter future crime equally. So what, which punishment should be chosen? Anyone? No volunteer? Yes, I see, I see someone at the chat already answered. Uh, yes, it should be a short jail sentence. Why? And does anyone want to make the other argument that should be a fine? Okay, someone raise their hand, please. Is it face? Yeah, uh, yeah not, not the other argument, sir. Just to elaborate on the short jail uh, sentence, because it is something which, uh, uh, which kind of uh, compromises on the freedom of movement and you know it, it is it is restrictive in nature uh, so that is the reason for that okay. rather than purely monetary in nature okay okay so so thank you so so there are two ways to address this issue uh, one is if we assume that the fine and the jail sentence generate the same deterrence and we only care about deterrence then the choice should be in terms of which of the two is more or less costly for the government 
right? And so the, the question would be if a fine or a, sent, a jail sentence is more or less costly to the government. That's one line, which would be the pure Beccarian approach. The other is what some of you have been raising, which is, well, but the consequences are not the same. So what that means in our language is that the deterrence effect is not the same. But that's a different approach to this question. And what you're trying to argue is that the jail sentence might be more effective than the fine. Yes. But then again, uh, restricting um, movement and restricting um, liberties also hinders economic productivity. And so we would need to think about the different costs and benefits here. So again, let me go over this. If we believe that the fine and the jail sentence are equal in terms of deterrence, and we only care about deterrence, then the answer would be, we should pick the policy with the lowest cost for the government. Now, if that's the final jail sentence, again, depends. We could say, well, it's the fine because it's just easy to get money from people than to put them in jail. But of course, on the other side, you could have an argument of judgment proof. Yes, but not everyone has money to pay that fine. And therefore, it would actually increase transaction costs. And therefore, a short jail sentence might potentially be cheaper um, if, if we think there are significant judgment proof uh, issues here. But that's an argument where you say, I only care about deterrence. I'm saying they're both equal for deterrence. Therefore, I should choose the one with the lowest cost. That's the Beccarian model. A different approach is to say, no, they have different implications. And because they have different implications in terms of movement, in terms of civil liberties, in terms of uh, economic productivity, then I need to look at the whole picture before I can actually make a choice of policy. Okay? So again, gives you a flavor why the Beccarian model is a very narrow model because it's only about deterrence and only about costs. But at the same time, the Becker model makes things very easy because once you say it's all about deterrence, it's all about costs, that's all I have to compare. Okay. Uh, I have, is it Sarah that raised the hand? Hello, good evening, sir. Uh, Hello. So my question, my question is that uh, when we uh, give a punishment and there is deterrence, that also depends on how much media coverage is there. So, for example, in cases of a death sentence, uh, which is reported uh, highly by the media, so we can say that uh, there is deterrence across the country, but in the example that you give, there there will be deterrence only in the community that that person belongs from, and um, the, uh, and in this case, if the circumstances that uh, led to the person committing the crime are also similar for the entire society, and then that person is punished just merely because of all the mitigating circumstances that played a role, then instead of causing deterrence, it could have the opposite effect and it could uh, increase outrage. So uh, how do we uh, deterrence? I mean, my question is deterrence could look very different for different communities and spaces. So how, uh, how do we take that into account? That's a good question, Sarah. So let me, let me go in different steps. Um, the first is, you are sort of saying, I don't agree with the hypothesis of the question, because the question starts by saying, suppose they are equal in terms of deterrence. And in basically what you're saying is they're not uh, because of the different uh, way uh, deterrence is achieved through media, through community talking, 
or through the way people relate to the punishment. And so if you were within the strictness of the example, uh, the answer would be everything you said should already be in, uh, accommodated, should have already been calculated in the presumption that deterrence is the same. Now, of course, in real life, that's not true. And I, I'm going to get the point you're making in real life. So in real life, the problem you have is um, how the community reacts to punishment, right? And that has to do with um, something that some economists have talked about, what they call as fair punishment. And that means if you think that there's an optimal percept, there's a perception of optimal fairness out there, then of course this will constrain, this should constrain your criminal policies because if you overreact, if you overpunish, it could actually have detrimental effects in the way that uh, the community does not think this is fair. And so this is not appropriate punishment. I think the challenge to your question is um, what is, how do we have these notions of fair punishment and where are they coming from, right? And again, I don't think economists can explain that very well um, because clearly, um, you know, again, people talk about the proportionality principle, right? That um, the punishments should be proportional to the crime. Um, but where, where, what, what is the meaning of proportional and how do we establish this proportionality? It's unclear. Um, we do know from comparative studies that different societies have very different notions of what proportional is, even within the same society, right? I mean, if you, I mean, the most studied, of course, are the Anglo-American societies in this respect. The notion of proportionality in the 17th and 18th century is not the same as now, right? I mean, in 17th and 18th century, people would be hanged for crimes and people were okay with that. And now we're not okay with that. So our own social norms have changed in relation to this proportionality. My only concern is um, how decisions by courts in criminal policy affect these notions of what's acceptable or not acceptable by a community. Uh, and, 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 and if that relation, if that effect is not well understood, uh, then you might actually be implementing uh, wrong policies. Uh, let me give you two examples, two problems, actual problems. One is, I don't know if that's the case in India, but in many countries in Europe, we have certain laws, criminal laws, um, that are not enforced. The idea is, we give a signal that certain things are not okay, but we don't enforce them. For example, typical examples, prostitution. Uh, many countries in Europe make prostitution illegal, but we don't actually go and punish prostitutes and their clients very often. You don't really do anything about it, but it's illegal. Uh, another one is in many countries in Europe, um, certain forms of abortion are crimes, but we don't really enforce, unlike the United States, where they're enforcing these things. But in Europe, abortion is highly regulated in countries like Italy or even Germany, but you don't really get people to be punished. 
uh, for having an abortion. Now, is this a good idea or a bad idea to have laws that tell you that you get punished, but then we don't really enforce them? And everybody knows we don't really enforce them. Well, it's a problem because you could say, well, it's a good idea because these crimes are not so important and we just want to signal, but we don't really want to get into some you know, controversy or some social policy about these things. But on the other hand, you have a crowding out effect on the community, which is, well, if you're saying that certain criminal laws are to be enforced and other criminal laws are not enforced uh, because sometimes we think they're important, sometimes we think they are not important, this will create confusion. This will create misunderstandings about the value of criminal law. So I think this is problematic in terms of community values. Are we helping or harming the community perception when we have these sort of laws that are more symbolic, right? And this is something that, for those of you who may want to read about this, this, this is what Richard McAdams and others, a Kutter to Bob Kutter, have talked about the expressive role of law and economics, of law, sorry, the expressive role of law, right? That you want to express some norm, but if you don't really enforce it, you may be hindering and undermining other norms. Because this is like a child, right? I mean, you, you know, I know many of you are students, so you don't have your children yet. But when you have your children, you don't want to start telling your children, you cannot do this, and then you don't punish. Because if you don't punish, the child understands this is empty. These are empty rules. And then how does the child know when this is empty and that is not empty? Why is this empty and that other behavior not empty? And so this is a problem. So this is one argument, the expressive rule of law and how this interacts with the community perception of what is a serious crime and not a serious crime, what's fair punishment and unfair punishment. The other argument is, it could be that within certain communities, and certain social groups, when you commit a crime, you're actually more successful because your group of friends thinks you're a nice person or you're a tough person or you're a hero when you do certain crimes, right? Now this becomes an issue because when you punish them, you're not actually deterring, you're promoting this, right? Because you're saying, Oh, this guy is a great guy because he did this sort of things and now he's getting punished. This shows how great he is or she is. Um, and so that's, that's sort of, and again, unclear if severe punishment should be the deterrent, uh, deterrent policy, right? I mean, I, I have my own paper on this apply to terrorism. If you think in terms of the psychology of terrorists that giving them the death penalty or executing them makes them heroes for their group, then the execution is not really deterrent because you're not really threatening them with punishment they care. You're actually threatening them with a reward for what they did, which that's how they perceive that in their own group. And so you have to be careful again how certain punishment might be punishment in the perception of a social group, but be perceived as a reward or some sort of heroic behavior within a different group. And so I think get, things get very complicated when you make this sort of, of, of calculations of what is and what is not the perception of the outside world. Now, remember, this is not in the Becker model. And Becker couldn't care less about this. He did not expand this uh, reasoning in, in this direction. But when you, when you go from the Becker model to policy design, you have to think about all these implications and how this affects um, how, people, how people behave. Okay, let me, let me read the second question. Oh, Renita, go ahead, please. So could this very important question be settled by just saying that, you know, maybe they don't represent the mainstream or the larger world 
uh, you know, this kind of a question could, would only be, would that kind of reduce the intensity of the uh, concern? Right, right, but that that gets into the sort of what are you trying to achieve with your policy? Because um, the issue would be, think about terrorism. The issue is, of course, 99% of the population is deterred. Um, as a terrorist, I mean, most people are not terrorists. Now, are they deterred really by the threat of punishment or is this a problem of social morality, of social values, right? And that's where it comes an issue because uh, when we are designing policy, would the policy uh, be targeting, targeting a specific group of people or is the, the policy targeting the whole society? Yes, of course, you're right. I mean, if, you, if you're talking about the whole society, what matters is the preferences and the reactions of the median voter or the median person, not the people on the extremes. But in certain crimes, we are targeting the extremes. And so we have to think how to sort of, how do these extremes behave, right? And, and so I think it will depend very much on the, on the, on the context where you're designing the, the, the policy. Most of the time, of course, as economists, we think about the marginal individual, the median voter. So that's what we care about, the median person, what the lawyers would call the reasonable person. Right? Uh, but many situations, we're not dealing with reasonable persons. We're not dealing with the average person. And so I think, I th I think it would be a little bit of, of a problem in certain contexts to ignore that extremes are going to be relevant in our policy design. When I saw a question by uh, Sarah, I think, let me see. Um, or is it, is it here? Yes, but that's, 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 uh, Sarah, I think that's a sort of a circular discussion. Um, because you would have to explain what our fair principles are and where they're coming from. Right? I think the, the thing with economists is that you do not define what's fair. You do not, you do not start with a set of fair principles, and then you derive uh, fines. So yes, they could be fines according to the fair punishment principles could be wrong from an economic point of view if they are inconsistent with efficiency. Now, the problem I'm saying is, however, if you're going to include notions of fairness in the concept of efficiency, which is what Polinsky and Chevelle did, in whatever paper, 2006 or seven, I think you end up with a, some, some sort of a circular tautological reasoning because you start saying, well, it's efficient because it's fair because I included the fair principles in the notion of efficiency, right? So you see, you, you, you start being circular in what you're doing because you're saying, well, it's efficient because it's fair. It's fair because fair has to be included in efficiency, but I don't really know where these notions of fairness are coming from. And so in that respect, the Beckerian model is a more rigorous way. I mean, it can be wrong, obviously. You can say, I, I, I disagree with Becker, but it, it pushes you away from this sort of circular uh, reasoning, which I think very soon, once you start talking about fair punishment principles, very soon you get into a circular, a circular reasoning. Unless, unless you have a good theory where the, why, where and why are these principles coming from, which I think gets you to uh, a long philosophy and more sort of discussion than, than economics. I hope this answered your question. Okay. Um, so let me, let me um, see if I can get to the next example that he has, and we can have a discussion. Um, Okay, Bloggs is sentenced to jail, but the jail is full and the jailer cannot legally add any more inmates. Now, the policies could be either the state builds another jail or the state has to release some old inmate to make room for blocks. The question is, which would be the right policy from an economic point of view. So essentially, you either build a new jail 
or you make room for this criminal by removing an old criminal. Oh, okay. I see someone already sort of looks like refers to removal policy. Anyone tries to go for the first? Yes, that's that's. Okay. Hang on, someone in the chat. Yes, that's the question. Okay, we have someone suggesting we should remove. Anyone wants to go for building a new jail? Don't be betrayed by your intuition. Think as an economist. So, as an economist, we should be thinking about, yes, 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 but you are a professor. You're not supposed to answer these questions. Yes, of course, it will depend on the marginal cost. Yes, yes, it should depend on the marginal cost. Yes, I mean, the intuition, obviously, is uh, that removing would be probably cheaper than building a new jail. Uh, so, intuitively, um, we might go there. But we have to think about the cost. So let's think removal. The problem we're going to have is that we're going to uh, have uh, some of these people back on the street. Uh, who could commit more crimes, but we're also signaling to everyone that um, sanctions are going to be lower than expected because people will have to be removed from jail at some point. So although we are convicting people to five years in jail, in fact, you're only doing two years because you have to be removed at some point in the future. So we're signaling that we're going to have lower sanctions, in fact, and we may have, you know, bad people on the street. So that's our that's our cost there. On the jail side, of course, the cost is obvious. We have to build a new jail, uh, which will, is going to be expensive. Now, I think I think. The answer is going to be depends on the marginal costs. If you think uh, signaling lower sanctions is actually more or less detrimental than the marginal cost of building a jail. And um, depending on that, we will go one way or the other. So the answer is, as Manita wrote, depends on the costs. Yes. Um, I think I think a lot of you were sort of intuitively going with the jail being more costly, but as one of you on the chat was reminding us, not necessarily. Um, it, it has to be uh, thought as um, there's costs with removing people from jail, and we have to sort of be able to measure those costs. Um, in practice, of course, if we're going to do this in a real life experiment, this is going to be tough. But we, we will need to uh, think about it. Okay, let me move to the third question, which is, hang on, I'm always getting lost in my questions. Okay, this one is, is an, a numerical example. So, a fifth shatters a car, a car window costing $100 and steals a radio worth $75. So, again, Breaking the car window costs $100, still a radio $75. Now, the question is, is the social cost of this crime $175, the victim's loss, $100, the victim's loss minus the injured's gain, or some other name, number? This is a tricky question. And you may have different answers depending if you're an economist, if you're thinking as an economist, or if you're thinking as a philosopher. Or a philosopher. Is the cost of crime the victim's loss, or is the cost of crime the victim's loss minus the benefit to the criminal? I see most of you are saying 175, which is the victim's loss. Yes, I think most of you are thinking as philosophers, not as economists. 
Yes, 175 is right if you're a philosopher. 100 is right if you're an economist. So I guess we have a room full of philosophers, not many economists. The reason is, yes, of course, most of us would say the victim's loss, obviously, because we care about the victim. But as an economist, remember, remember your Pareto principle. You need, this is a transaction. This is a transaction. So you need to take into account the benefits to the other side. Sure, it's not a non-consensual transaction, but it's a transaction. So from an economic point of view, the cost is 100 because you have to discount the benefits to the criminal from the equation. In fact, if you think I am being tricky, I recommend you read the entire book, Kaplan Chevelle, Fairness versus Welfare, where they explain why it has to be 100 and not 175. In fact, they show that if you exclude the benefits of the criminal, in some cases, you will ad adopt policies that are not Pareto efficient. Now, obviously, this is a policy. Th this is a rhetorical question. I mean, yes, it's um, the book is Fairness versus Welfare by Professors Kaplow and Chevelle. I think it's Harvard University Press. It's an old book. It's from 2000 or something like that. But they, they, they do handle this discussion. Um, is this a very relevant discussion? It's not. It's rhetorical. Um, because um, in practice, it doesn't really matter uh, given that uh, we will not know these numbers and our policies are going to be looking at average costs and average benefits. So this is not really going to be an issue. But it is an issue if you want to think in normative terms, in, in, in terms of philosophical versus economics. And the reason, again, is uh, if you use your Pareto principle, remember, for those who are not familiar, Pareto principle is you reach efficiency when you cannot improve someone without hurting somebody else. And so if you're thinking in terms of efficient policies, um, you need to think about the criminals as being somebody else in this equation. And therefore, you need to understand if um, the benefits um, of the criminal are accounted in the formula. Um, of course, this gets into nasty questions like, how do you account for this? when it's non-economic crimes, when it's non-financial crimes, and all of these discussions, of course, they exist. Uh, if you read the book, the book has discussions on this, how to commodify, how to calculate these losses. I'm not going to get there, but I do want to call your attention to this, to this controversy over what to do with the benefits to the criminal. Should they be ignored? Um, if you're a philosopher, you would say yes, because this guy, has uh, violated the social contract, and this is no longer an abiding social contract. So why should we care about the benefits to that side? But on the other hand, from a Pareto efficiency point of view, you have to take them into account if you want to make, uh, if you want to design efficient policies. And on there's another comment here, which I'm trying to read. Yes. Uh, now, again, it's the same argument. You would, from an economic point of view, you would have to do the same argument. So, a suspension of the driving license is definitely uh, more expensive than a fine from the viewpoint of the driver and from the viewpoint of the government. The problem is, again, which is more um, deterrent. If you think fines do not operate as effective deterrents because either people don't pay them or because people don't care about fines, then of course uh, suspending a driving license might be more efficient. 
But this applies in the context of road accidents as it could apply in uh, the setting of professional duties. Uh, when should we suspend a medical license or a lawyer license? Or should we just impose fines when lawyers or doctors commit regulatory violations? Well, the answer would be, well, fines are cheaper for sure. But if people don't care about fines, then suspending professional licenses could actually be uh, more efficient. So this will depend on the marginal benefit and the marginal, uh, the marginal cost. Uh, yes, of course, you will have to think also on the probability of detection of driving without a license. If that probability is zero, then suspending a license has no effect, right? If no one checks the license, then it has no effect. Of course, you have to look at this, but it's the same with the fine. If no one pays the fine, then the fine has no effect. So again, that's why you have to uh, sort of look at um, what is the most effective deterrent mechanism. Um, okay. So let me go for the for the last question here. John, where is it? Um, Okay, I guess this one is a very long one. Let me try to put on the chat box. Uh, but, okay, let me see if I can. Okay. Um, so this is, this is basically about Yvonne wants to increase her security uh, against burglars. She has three alternatives install bars on their windows, a loud burglar alarm, buy a gun. The issue is uh, which of them would be more efficient. And uh, it introduces a, another topic here, which is a possible displacement effect. Um, so let me talk a little bit about displacement effect and then we'll go to the question. The issue here is what people call um, the private um, law enforcement, that is what victims can do to deter crime. The problem is that many times you do not have a deterrent effect, but a displacement effect. That is, if I take measures to be uh, more um, accurate or more effective at deterring crime against me, one of the consequences could be that I'm increasing crime against other people, right? So I'm displacing. So a neighborhood where you, you know, a gate community in a neighborhood where you're very effective protecting your neighborhood from assault, that might actually lead to more burglar, burglaries in different other neighborhoods. So you're not really deterring crime, you're displacing crime. And so that's what the question introduces. Yes, so the issue here is exactly what is the role of a burglar alarm? So a burglar alarm could go both ways. You can make the argument that it raises awareness in your neighbors and has a deterrent effect, right? Because the burglars get scared and run away. But it could also have a displacement effect because if people, if the burglars know your house as a burglar alarm and the, the house next to you does not have a burglar alarm, then what you're doing is you're displacing them to the house next to you. And if that's what's going on, then the problem, as you can imagine, is, going, is you're going to have overinvestment in precaution because people will be investing in precaution against crime, but displacing these crimes. So let me give you an example we had here in Virginia a few months ago. Uh, one of our counties um, here, where actually the university is not a law school, but the campus of the university, uh, had a very high crime rate in the last two years during COVID. So what they decided was to have some curfew for anyone below um, 21. So anyone below 21, had to be home by 6 p.m. and could not leave home uh, before 6 a.m. 
And the general thrust of the policy was that a lot of the crimes were being committed by young people uh, and, you know, burglary, uh, car theft and things like that. And so the policy was, if we put these people at home from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, and, we, and we have police checking this, then we will sort of decrease crime. <coughs> and in fact, crime went down in this county. But what happened was there was a displacement of crime to the neighboring counties because many of these mobs of youth, what they did was they have to be home at 6 p.m. So it's, you know, 5.30, 5.45 p.m. Rather than going home, they would go to the neighboring counties where they could go around. There was no police checking them. And they would stay all evening and all night doing bad things and then come back at 6, 10 in the morning when they're not being checked in their county anymore. So what seemed to be an effective policy to deter crime became actually displacement policy that displaced crime to other counties. And of course, as you can imagine, the other counties were not excited and very happy about this development. Yes, so, so here the issue is the same in this example. Um, while bars on the windows and a gun is sort of not very clear uh, in terms of displacement effect, an alarm has this problem that creates awareness but also creates displacement, right? I mean, of course, a gun can have the same effect or the bars could have the same effect as long as they're clear and publicized, right? So here, if we want to look at the three policies, we would have to judge them in terms of deterrence and in terms of displacement. So for example, buy a gun uh, would, would be uh, an important issue if you, of course, have an announcement at your door saying, I, this is a house with a gun. Because then the burglars will say, okay, maybe we need to go to other houses that have no guns. That would be the displacement effect. If nobody knows you have a gun, but you actually have a gun, uh, then there is very little deterrent effect overall because the burglars don't know you have a gun. Right? Whereas the alarm, if it sounds, they will know and they'll be aware you have an alarm. So this, this question really introduces the issue of displacement and the issue of private uh, enforcement. Okay. Now, I've, I'm done here. Let me go on and then I'll repeat these examples. Any questions at this stage? Okay. Um, can I suggest we do a break of... 10 minutes. What, what, what time are we supposed to end in an hour, right? More or less. Yes, professor. 8.30. 8.30. But 8.30, your time. Sorry. And I have to so calculate can... back into my time. So 8.30 is in oh, about one, one hour and 10 minutes. One hour and 10 minutes. minutes. So let's do a 10 minutes break and then come back for, for one hour. Is that okay? Yes, professor. Yes. We'll do that. Yes. Yes. So let's let's stop for 10 minutes now. Uh, let me take these a few minutes and extend a very, very warm welcome to all the participants. I see my good friends uh, also here as participants. Um, Dr. Kaur, Dr. Chauhan, Dr. D'Souza, Dr. Shivasta. I, I, if I'm missing out names, then please, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, just overlook that. And other participants, uh, students and practitioners, a very, very warm welcome to all of you. And um, it's really, it encourages us very much that um, you show, continuously you've shown a very deep interest in this uh, domain of specialization. So, uh, on this very warm um, note of welcome. Anybody wants to exchange a few hellos here? Or anybody wants to give some input?
and please feel free to ask questions you know because um oh you're also very welcome and thank you for your sustained interest and encouragement uh, yeah so i would really encourage you to ask questions because see it's not a line of thinking that we are familiar with it takes a lot of reading and a very very you know very 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 bold objective outlook to actually understand what's happening and yes you also need you know a bit of a background of economics to really understand the cold concepts of costs uh, the cold concepts of behavioral sciences and so on and so forth. So uh, that bit of a barrier uh, is something we will all, you know, come across. But a bit of reading and open mindedness, uh, you know, um, compels us to see the logic in that. And also, as Professor Garupa has been telling us, that none of these uh, models, theories, concepts are really very comprehensive in themselves. You know, they are issues that have been flagged, uh, issues with regard to policy that have been brought to attention. Uh, but then the society has changed, has changed, uh, changes. So it's very dynamic, and we find that those theories, those uh, approaches, uh, you know, are not may be complete enough to be able to answer all the dimensions. But then research and knowledge is this ongoing process, you know, with the dynamics of society. Uh, that's what our work is. That's what researchers and practitioners, that's where we need to, uh, you know, those are the problems we need to solve and we need to use the most scientific tools to do it not just a lot of argument, but argument based on facts, data, logic. Yes. Yeah, we understand that, uh, Dr. Chauhan. Um, so let's just say that within the given constraints, we will try and maximize, you know, the outcomes. So just let's let's leave it at that, and also think of policy wherein our um, uh, you know constraints can get relaxed a bit. Uh, yeah, those can be our policy suggestions. You can bring it to your administration. And once again, please ask questions. So with about 45 participants uh, present here, I did see very few communications. And I would welcome a few more.
Uh, so Ashish, uh, there are two parts of uh, the two parts to your question. <clears throat> the first is, um, you know, uh, the concept of liability. How does it change um, when harm is intentional? So primarily, the difference would be between. So. In terms of, you know, the whole uh, difference between what is known as liabilities and which are known as, as punishment. So the whole idea of um, of deterrence that comes into punishment. So all liabilities uh, are not calibrated with punishment and the objective of uh, meeting all liabilities is not calibrated with uh, is not calibrated with deterrence. So that's one basic, um, you know, uh, difference. And to the second question, as far as political economy, if you ask me, yes, definitely. <clears throat> Changes in political economy do impact, uh, you know, everything, the definition of crime and punishment. So that's my preliminary answer. Professor Garupa can please take it up. Uh, welcome back, Professor Garupa. There's one question in the chat box. It was addressed to me, so I took the liberty to of answering it. And uh, yes, yes. Let me, let me go over, over them. Um, um, so let me start with the second question and then go to the first question. Yes, um, part of the issue with the backer model and most of the literature is that. Um, Crime is taken as defined, but of course, if you add um, how crime is defined and how punishment is calibrated, yes, political economy will impact. And there's some economists who have written about this, showing how, um, for example, changes in the preferences of the median voter might affect um, what's defined as crime and how punishment is calibrated. So yes, the answer is yes. Um, I would add another important aspect, which I have not emphasized is, um, if you take crime as criminal law in, in the strictest legal sense, I don't think economists have a good theory for the boundaries of criminal law, right? Why are certain behaviors considered crime and why are certain behaviors uh, considered mere torts, for example, uh, that is uh, sort of problematic. Um, if, if you're interested in that, there's an old article by Posner uh, in the Columbia Law Review, 1985. I think it's called Criminal Law. Uh, and it tries to provide an economic theory of criminal law in the sense of why is that certain acts are codified as crimes and other acts are not codified as crime. And I don't think he has a good theory. I mean, I think the paper really does not deliver on the promise. Um, for example, he essentially defines this in terms of consensual versus non-consensual interactions. Uh, but that's a problem because prostitution is consensual. And so why is that a crime? Illegal gambling is consensual. Uh, why is that a crime then? And, and so he does not have a sort of a, 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 a good convincing framework that explains all typologies of criminal law. The other issue, which gets to your first question, is, of course, we have in the common law something called intentional torts. Well, if the difference between crimes and torts is intention, then we should not have intentional torts. They should be crimes, uh, which gets into different and tricky discussions because um, what is the meaning of intentional here? And again, for economists, this is going to be a hard issue because if your actions are the product of cost-benefit analysis, that means that whatever happens, you might not intend 
but you considered as part of your decision. And if you use that as the legal meaning of intention, uh, then these things become treaty, right? And this goes into, some of you may be familiar with the Pinto case, right? The Pinto case is the famous case in the United States <coughs> where consumers filed a lawsuit against Fort Pinto and they argued that they were liable, that the manufacturer was liable for the accident that took place because he had studied, the manufacturer had studied from a cost benefit analysis perspective, the possibility of those accidents taking place. That is, they had a report saying that the, the manufacturer had considered the possibility of accidents and then decided that on a cost benefit analysis, it was not worthwhile to invest on preventing those accidents. Now, the court decides that's evidence of intention. Well, if doing a cost benefit analysis of the consequences of your behavior is evidence of intention, then everything we do in economics is intentional because you're supposed to be doing cost benefit analysis all the time. So it does become sort of treasury, treachery and, and difficult here to treat what intention means in the sense that you have considered that particular crime as part of your cost benefit analysis. And therefore, if you consider the cost benefit analysis as evidence of intention, then everything is intentional uh, anyway. So it's a little bit uh, of a problem. The other issue here is um, what is social harm? And as I said, uh, social harm in, in, in these terms has to be some sort of external effect. So the issue is that uh, there is some harm that's not strictly speaking the harm or limited to the harm of the victim. Because if there were only the harm of the victim, then it's unclear why we don't regulate crimes by some sort of cozy and bargaining. Okay, the harm caused by the criminal, since it only affects a victim, then the victim should be able to negotiate compensation from the criminal. That's not how we think about criminal law. And the reason why we don't, of course, one of the possibilities is that there are very high transaction costs, which do not allow any sort of cozy and bargaining. That's one argument, obviously. But the other argument is that there's social damage that goes beyond the losses of the victim. And therefore, if you only compensate the losses of the victim, this will not internalize the costs of the criminal action. Okay, I hope I... Uh, answered your your questions, but again, uh, you you should read Posner eighty five. I I think it's going to be sort of addressing these points. Although again, I I'm not completely sure that he has a very convincing argument in terms of how economics explains um, the codification of criminal law. What's codified as criminal law and what's not codified as criminal law. Okay. So I, I, I wanted um, to go back to some of the points we were making because I want to sort of um, explain um, the limitations and the critiques to the basic uh, Beccarian model. Now, the, the first, um, so I, I, I will not go over all the problems and all the criticisms, um, but I want to emphasize some of the arguments why the insights from Becker are problematic, because that in itself offers some explanations in terms of policy discussion. So the first, the first set of critiques comes from the work of Stigler and people who followed up on Stigler, and it's called the marginal deterrence argument. Some of you may have heard the expression. 
And the argument he has is the following. If we do what Becker recommends us, um, we run into a problem because people do not have resources to pay very high fines all the time. And so you cannot simply have all crimes having high fines and low probability or high punishment and low probability. Because at some point, people won't have resources to pay for that. So what you have in practice, of course, is a sort of a menu. You expect more serious crimes to have tougher sanctions and less serious crimes to have less severe sanctions. And what Stigler calls this is the marginal deterrence issue, which is, is essentially saying, I want to deter people from committing crimes. Sure, as Becker said, but if people are going to commit crimes, if people are going to engage in criminal conduct, then I want them to commit the least serious crimes rather than the more serious crimes. So now the issue is not really a binary choice. You do or you don't do crimes. The issue is a continuum where you will do some crimes, but occasionally, and what you should be incentivized is to do less serious crimes. So if that's what we want to do, then of course we don't want very severe sanctions all the time. We only want severe sanctions for the most serious crimes. Now, this sounds sort of trivial because that's what we have in our criminal law systems anyway, but you see how Stigler makes Becker's point more realistic. It's no longer a question of severe sanctions. It's a question of severe sanctions for severe crimes and less severe sanctions for less harmful crimes. But the reasoning is a marginal deterrence argument is I want to deter people overall, yes, but at the same time, I want to make sure if they're not deterred, then then they will opt for less rather than for more serious uh, crimes. Now, there's some policy applications. So the policy application I like always to use to illustrate this was a discussion in the UK in the light, late 1990s about aggravating the sanctions for rape and making them equal to murder, homicide. Well, the problem of that policy is that if you say that you get the same sanction for rape and for murder, then it means that your marginal deterrence has been hurt. Now, of course, you could say, I don't believe rapists and murderers are rational, and so it doesn't matter. That's a different argument, obviously, to reject the economic paradigm for those sort of crimes. That's a different argument, which is perfectly reasonable to make, but it's another discussion. Here, in the economic paradigm, so we're assuming people are rational decision makers, then what you're saying to them is that the cost of rape is the same as cost of murder, which in fact means you provide an incentive for the rapist to actually kill the victim because you're saying it's the exact same crime, it's not being aggravated. So that is a violation of the marginal deterrence principle. The reform didn't go ahead for other reasons, but it does seem to reflect some of the arguments of the marginal deterrence. It's a little bit like when you escalate penalties, when people say, we need to be tough on other issues, right? Let's see, we need to be tough on corruption. We need to be tough on certain violations. Well, if you escalate the penalties for certain actions without escalating the entire menu of um, actions, then you're making certain actions now cheaper than they were before. So you have to think of this as a bit of a menu in a restaurant. You 
first, the terrace is, do we want to eat or don't we want to eat in this restaurant? Marginally terrace means now that we're going to eat in this restaurant, which we shouldn't, but we decided to eat there, you have to pick some uh, dishes from the menu. And you want to make sure you incentivize the menu so that the worst crimes are more expensive and, that, and, and, and the less severe crimes are cheaper. The problem is when you look at the menu and you say, for whatever policy reason, I change the price of one particular issue at the menu, you're changing the relative prices and you have to see what will be the consequences. It could be okay or it could be not okay, depending on how you actually um, see this. So it does, it does tell you that in terms of public policy, you should always consider the marginal deterrence argument as a very serious argument in thinking about crimes. Yes, I want to go there. Uh, I know uh, I, you, you, we have to do this in two ways. Um, the issue is, are crimes of passion really rational? Right? And I think every, all of us will say no, many crimes of passion are not rational. But the consequence is, what does this mean in, in, in terms of economic choice? Right? I think there's some sound here. Uh, someone is not muted. Ooh. Okay, I think everyone is muted now. Participants, please uh, mute yourselves. Um, I, th I think everyone is. I, I'm sort of the co-host, so I can see that everyone is muted now. Now, there are two ways we can address this in economics. And both are problematic. One is simply to say we cannot use the rational choice model here. We have to get out of the rational choice model. But then, of course, is how do we deal with this? Um, because what does it mean, uh, uh, um, uh, a crime of passion? Does it mean it's undeterrable? Uh, you know, does it mean that there's some emotional component that should be discounted? So that's a, dif that's a difficult discussion. The other one is what Becker does, which I think is self-defeating, which is to say, well, it's easy. Crimes of passion are crimes for which the benefit is usually more significant than the cost. The problem with this, so you would say the benefit goes to infinite and therefore it's always greater than the cost and it's never deterred. So they are undeterrable. Well, the problem is if they are undeterrable, uh, what do you do with them, right? I mean, you can't prevent them. That's what you're saying from an economic choice point of view. You, you can't prevent them. You can't deter them. And, and so the only alternative is to go into the incapacitation model is people who are uh, inclined to do this sort of crimes of passion must then be uh, put away because uh, they're more likely to repeat this. I don't think this is a very you know, challenging policy implication. And so usually the way I handle this is to say, well, how much are these crimes of passion uh, avoidable and how much are they not? Right. And actually, if you look at the statistics of violent um, uh, murder, uh, then uh, you would see in the United States that the statistics do not seem to indicate a lot of crimes of passion. The vast majority are actually planned and, and intended. So, you know, I'm not completely sure about the statistics in India, how much of this is actually crimes of passion and how much are not. Um, and I, I wonder that, yes, Sarah makes it a note here. Of course, if you're going to argue <clears throat> as economists, this is a matter of preferences, then rehabilitation is, 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 is of course, I mean, by rehabilitation, we could even in, include some sort of, you know, therapy, uh, psychiatric therapy or that sort of, of approach. But then again, I think you're getting into outside of economics because this means changing preferences. That's what we're saying. 
that in, in a way emotions reflect preferences and we need to change these preferences to have the right emotions. Right. Okay, so I'm sorry, I don't have a, I don't have a, a better answer to that, to that question. Okay. Um, marginal deterrence, any questions here? Okay, so I think the marginal de deterrence argument is sort of intuitive. Uh, why Becker was wrong? Because Becker thought that people commit crimes as a binary choice. He didn't really realize this is a continuum. Uh, you don't decide to be a criminal or not a criminal, right? I mean, the first time you violate the law in your life, and I'm sure all of us have violated the law a few times. If you're lawyers, you're not supposed to say you have done it, so don't say it. But I think I'm an economist, so I can say. Um, in that in that respect, uh, it's a continuum of choices, right? It's not like I decide to become a criminal because I decided not to, you know, pay taxes or I decided to spit when I'm not supposed to do. Yes, how do we determine the severity of this crime? So the severity of the crimes, again, as I was saying, Sarah has a question, good question, it goes back to the previous uh, inter interaction. You have to assume that uh, there is a social loss that goes beyond the victim. Because remember, if you assume the crime, no matter how severe you think it is, the loss is for the victim, then we could go back to whatever Iceland and in fact, the common law had in the Middle Ages, mostly, or Rome. Remember, the Romans had no criminal law in the sense we have. As you remember, those of you who studied Roman law or, or the beginnings of the common law, um, which is sort of Viking law, uh, Norman law, all those systems, essentially crime and criminal law was private, right? That's why you have a lot of private prosecution of criminal law in, in England until quite late in the 19th century, because essentially it was private in the sense that it's the victim or the relatives of the victim, obviously, who should prosecute the criminal. And it's a sort of a cozy, I mean, it's not a cozy bargaining, but it's sort of a cozy solution. The victim prosecutes the criminal and gets compensated, right? So in that respect, uh, if that's what crimes are about, the Romans were right. There's no need for all the, the status, the state intervention we have. Uh, we think there is a reason for that, which is that the loss is not just a loss to the victim. There's a general loss to society for, you know, disturbing the peace, disturbing um, all of that. Uh, yes, so I think corruption, I agree with you, should be high on social losses. Uh, to a large extent, corruption, if you think about, it's again a hard case. If you don't consider social losses, because remember, corruption, most of the time, is a bargaining. I give you something, you give me something in return. So we have a bargaining solution, and therefore, uh, it has to be that there is a very big social loss with a serious problem, which is diffused across victims. So no one privately has an incentive to prosecute, right? That's why going back to my example of Rome and the beginnings of the common law, corruption was hardly prosecuted. Why? Because there's no obvious victim of corruption. It's all of us. And so there's very little incentive for one of us to actually prosecute this corruption. Corruption was large in Roman society precisely because no one prosecuted corruption. No one had an interest in prosecuting corruption because there was no obvious victim to prosecute uh, corruption. Now, let me say for those of you who like these topics, if you want to read a different point of view, David Friedman, who is a professor at Santa Clara University, is the son of Milton Friedman the Nobel Prize, has an article, I think it's in the Boston University Law Review, I, I, you know, I don't remember exactly, which is called Expropriating the Victims. His argument is that criminal law expropriates the victims. 
that the private system was much better because the private system assigned property rights. And when you have criminal law being prosecuted by the state, his argument is that we are uh, disturbing incentives because we are essentially expropriating the victims from their right to prosecute uh, the criminals and to get retribution against the criminals. So it's a sort of a libertarian sort of argument. I don't buy it, but for those of you who want to sort of read the other point of view, please you know, Google David Freedom uh, and you'll find in his website, he must be there, it's, it's, it's an old article, 1980s, 1984, 85, 86, 88 maybe, but it's in the 1980s where he tries to make the opposite argument. Okay. So let me let me use Sarah's suggestion of corruption to, to introduce another argument uh, against Becker. This, this was introduced by Lanz and Posner in uh, 1975, and then many people wrote about this. I have a few articles myself on, on this topic. The problem, if you're going to have very severe sanctions, fines, as, as Becker suggested, is that you're going to have a lot of corruption. Because if I am going to pay $3 million as a fine and the police officer that's detecting me or the prosecutor is paid $500, of course, I have an incentive to corrupt and the other side has an incentive to uh, be corrupted. So the problem with fines is if you make very severe fines, you, unless you pay a lot of money to the police and to the judges, you're going to induce corruption, more corruption. And corruption, let's think about it. Our concern is not just the ethical issue of corruption. Our problem with corruption is that corruption undermines enforcement because that means people are going to pay less than they should pay. They're going to pay the bribe. They're not going to pay the fine. And so we are concerned about corruption not just because it's a crime itself, but because it undermines the terms of other crimes. So if that's our concern, again, we need to rethink Becker's result. We need to say, well, if our salaries are very low, if we don't pay a lot of money to our judges and prosecutors and police, then we need a system that unfortunately should have lower fines and more probability. That is, we should have lower crimes, but the higher probability of detection to compensate the fact that we need to lower fines to avoid corruption. Related to this is another sort of argument, which is called the avoidance argument. Here is how the argument goes. If you're going, if I have to pay a fine of 100 bucks or 150 bucks, I'll pay it. If you tell me for the same action, the fine is a million dollars, then of course I'm buying, the, I'm, 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 I'm lawyering up, I'm getting a lawyer, I'm going to be more careful in avoiding evidence, and I'm going to litigate this. So you make the system more expensive. That's something that Becker did not thought about. It, that people might be willing to pay low fines with no problem, but if the fines are very high, you're going to make a very expensive system because people are more likely to litigate. People are more likely to have lawyers and people are more likely to be careful in terms of, you know, hiding evidence, avoiding evidence, what we call avoidance activities, engage in activities that are going to avoid these punishments. So I think we need to be careful with high fines for corruption, bribes, and for avoidance activities. Right? So a system with lower fines could be more effective. Right? There's a comment on the chat saying this could be a problem in India. Yes, I can see this being a problem in India and many, not just many uh, developing economies, even in developed economies. I think this is a problem because most of the time, police in particular, do not have a very high salary, right? And if you want police to be paid to bribes, this is going to be a distortion in the system, right? 
for two reasons. One, because the bribes are not going to be efficient. And then, of course, you have another problem we haven't introduced, which, which is, of course, false positives and false negatives. So far, all this discussion assumes that we only punish criminals. But, of course, our systems are not perfect. And sometimes we have false positives. That is, people who are innocent but get convicted. Now, if we're going to have a system based on bribes, there's going to be an incentive for false positives. That is, for the police to stop and arrest people who are not really doing any criminal activity, but just to get bribed. And, uh, and that's not a good way to design your, your criminal system. Yes, I mean, you could increase the punishment for corruption. Uh, although, again, you'll inevitably have moral litigation. Uh, but it's, again, this is sort of what we were saying about the marginal deterrence. See how you're changing the menu. Because now your problem is not just traffic offenses, your problem is corruption. And once your problem is corruption, your problem is also the underlying offenses. So once we start changing the menu and saying, okay, let's make corruption more uh, punished, let's punish with more corruption, right? But, but then what? Then, then we have to think about other financial crimes. Then we have to think about other repercussions. Uh, like, you know, obstruction of justice, uh, elimination of evidence, all of these things. Because if corruption is going to be more punished, then the police will engage in obstruction of justice, elimination of evidence, and all this. So we have to think about, you know, globally, how changing one aspect is going to affect our menu of, of sanctions. Now, remember, a lot of reforms in criminal justice system fail precisely because people do not understand that this has to be thought as a menu rather than, oh, I'm upset about this, let's do it, right? So remember the story in the UK. I'm sorry I'm giving a lot of examples from the UK, but I did most of my PhD and LLM in the UK, so that's, that's the one I'm more familiar with, many of these policy stories. I don't follow so much these policies in the US. Um, in the UK, um, the, the Tony Blair government at, at some point said, um, we want to force parents to bring kids to school, right? And they call what they call the community orders, that if we issue a community order against the parent, the parent has to bring the kid to school or else it's going to be subject to a fine, which I think was not, you know, was 50 75 pounds. So not particularly huge fine, but 50 pounds. Now, here's the problem with this policy, as you can imagine. Most of the families affected by this policy are not going to be the wealthy people or the middle class. Middle class and wealthy people take kids to school. This is not the people who are not taking kids to school. This is going to be the lower economic classes. For them, a fine of $50, 50 pounds is a lot of money. So what happened is they enforced the community orders. The parents of these dysfunctional families don't bring the kids to school. You have to enforce the community orders. And so you go to these parents, usually a single mother, most of the time, and you now find with 50 pounds. And then she says, I don't have 50 pounds. Now, what does the law tell you when people don't have money to pay fines? They have to go to jail. So now you're putting in jail the single mother of the kid that you wanted to go to school. And now the kid is not going to have a mother for a week. So not only the kid is not going to go to school, the kid is going to be abandoned by the mother for a week because the mother is in jail to pay for the 50 pounds community order. And most of the time, the mother is the only person in the family that brings money to the family and food. So not only are you going to have the kid not going to the school, the kid is going to do some work, probably illegal, to basically make up for the money that the mother is not making that week because she's in jail. So you can see how a well-intended policy to actually help kids coming to school, 
ends up being a disaster from a legal point of view because he did not take took into account the different situations. Yes, it's a community order for 50 pounds. But the problem is that the law says when you cannot pay the 50 pounds, you have to go to jail for four days for the local jail to make up for the 50 pounds, which was not the intention of the legislator, of course. But that's the general criminal law um, and, uh, being applied there. So that's what I'm saying. You need to think about all the implications of these policies. Because policies that look good in paper and you say, okay, this is good, we're going to do this. Well, they may have consequence, unintended consequences because um, they have to think about it. Yes, someone is saying, yes, probably paying for the mothers to take the kids to school is a smarter policy than community orders to punish the mothers for not bringing the kids to school. Right? So a reward, of course, it's going to be more expensive for the government, sure. So the marginal cost is going to be higher. But probably a, re a rewarding is better than, uh, you know, than punishment. You could say with, 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 with kids, with juvenile delinquency, you may argue that with juvenile delinquency, in some cases, rewarding the kids for not doing juvenile delinquency could be more productive than punishing the kids who engaged in juvenile uh, delinquency. I mean, there's, of course, again, the policies are expensive. We have to see the cost of doing this. But again, rewarding might be more efficient than punishing within certain policies and certain, and certain areas. Okay. So the last, the last point I wanted to mention of these critics, there are many critics to Becker. I'm just sort of putting him in groups. So the marginal deterrence sort of critiques, the corruption avoidance activities sort of critique. And the other, the other one I want to uh, talk about is um, the problem of false positives and false negatives. Um, one of the arguments against the death penalty, it's obviously that if you execute an innocent people, you can't reverse this later, right? So, so far in the Beckerian sort of way, we didn't talk about what happens to innocent people in the system, right? I mean, what happens to them when they get convicted? If our system is not very efficient, right? Uh, we're going to convict a lot of innocent people. If, if our system is very bad. And we need to take care, care of that. So maybe again, lower sanctions are less problematic when we have a lot of innocent people getting convicted. Now, the issue is how can we not convict innocent people? Unfortunately, since uh, the Greeks for 3,000, 4,000 years, we have been looking for a solution to this problem and we don't have a solution to this problem, right? Because you can't open our brains and check, is, are you guilty or not? But there's a few issues here that we need to think as economists. First, if we lower the standard of proof, right? If we lower the standard of proof, we're going to convict more innocent people. So how do we address this problem in criminal law? By setting a beyond reasonable doubt standard of proof. But as we increase the standard of proof, we are also now acquitting more guilty, right? So there's a trade-off. And those of you who remember and have done your Blackstone, remember Blackstone in the comments to the common law in the late 18th century says, what is it? Better, better to release 10 guilty than convict one innocent. So in his view, the ratio is one to 10. If the ratio is one to 10, of course, that means we're going to have beyond reasonable doubt at the 90 or 95% level. But that means we are saving a lot of innocent, but we are acquitting a lot of guilty. So that's the first thing we need to understand is a trade-off. 
between false positives and false negatives. And if we believe in Blackstone, and we think that is way more costly to convict innocent than acquit innocent, guilty, then we're going to acquit a lot of guilty. So no surprise that our rates of detection are so low because our system is built in to be way more concerned about the innocence than about uh, the guilty. The second argument here I want to make is all of this sort of discussion presumes two things, which again, economists have addressed this, but it's complicated. One, that guilty, innocent is binary. You are either guilty or innocent. Well, in many situations, this is a continuum, right? I mean, you're not necessarily guilty at the same level. Sometimes you're guilty of something, but not some other things. So you can imagine there's a continuum, right? And so things get more complicated, right? Um, when you sort of know things, but don't participate in those acts, are you guilty or not? That's a matter of a continuum where, of course, you could say some people are truly innocent, some people are truly guilty, and then many people are in between. They have a degree of guilt, but it's not really that they are fully guilty as the most um, you know, committed criminals. So take into account binary continuum, maybe this is more of a continuum than a binary. The second is, of course, perceptions. A lot of people, not a lot of people, but many people may commit crimes without understanding they're committing crimes. That is, your perception is that what you're doing is not illegal. And your perception might be right or wrong. Now, we know, and it's sort of rational, that uh, no, uh, not knowing the law is not an excuse, obviously, because if it were an excuse, everyone would use that excuse. So it's perfectly rational that all legal systems do not accept as a defense that you did not know the law. That's not an acceptable defense. That's rational, because if it were accepted, this would be sort of an inflation of people saying, I didn't know the law, I'm sorry, I apologize, right? You know? But there's an argument that as economists, we have to consider that people effectively might not know the law. They cannot use that as a defense, but this might be an issue. This gets into a discussion about the way we design incentives in our society is actually quite wrong. Because now think about that. Your problem is a problem of perception, knowledge. Do we know the law or not? So what we should have is incentives for people to actually acquire knowledge of the law before they do stupid things. That is, ask your lawyer if you can do this. But most of us, I think, I'm almost sure many of us, only go to a lawyer after we do stupid things. Usually we don't go to a lawyer before we do stupid things. We don't go to a lawyer and ask, can I do this? Usually we go to the lawyer saying, I did this, and now they say it's a crime. I need you to defend me. Now see how this is distorted incentives, because what we should have is incentives to acquire information before we do our actions, but actually the incentives are for us to acquire information after we do our actions. Yes, of course, Sarah has a point, and of course that's the main reason. It's uh, essentially the cost of acquiring information, expose or exempt or expose. Uh, most people don't have resources. So obviously they will not have information to acquire information um, before. And therefore they in fact commit actions that they don't know it's their crimes or not. In fact, as, as Sarah says, it might even be that after committing your action, you think you're innocent. You don't even know if you're innocent because you don't really know uh, if, if that particular action is a crime or not, right? I mean, uh, yes, I mean, your point you're making about innocent people being convicted is an issue that's really difficult to estimate. 
Um, because yes, of course, um, lower economic groups will have difficult access to representation for sure. But also, um, the problem is that for certain crimes, let me say, you will not have lower economic groups committing significant financial crimes or significant economic crimes, right? You can see also the issues of opportunity. Yes, they may do burglary or they may do assault or they may even do murder, but they will not be committing sophisticated financial crimes or uh, sophisticated rings of prostitution or sophisticated uh, business uh, enterprises involving criminal activities. So there's so much you can say about this. Uh, on the other side of the balance, it goes back to a question that someone raised earlier, the political economy. The problem also with the lower economic groups, economic, social economic groups, is that they're, they're, some of their behaviors are more likely to be criminalized because they don't have the political economy influence to you know, affect the criminal law. Whereas the most, the wealthier, of course, will have the lobbying needed to uh, um, legalize some of their actions. So the whole thing is a bit complicated when you think in terms of political economy. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's the same in the United States, as you know. Uh, most of the poor people, uh, most of the people who get death penalty in the United States are poor people. Um, but again, there's different arguments here you can make. Is it a problem of representation or is it a problem of context and opportunity, right? Um, is, it, is it that they are more likely to commit these sort of crimes than the wealthier people? Or is it that they have the same likelihood, but their defense is worse, right? This is complicated when you want to look at uh, the overall statistics. Um, but clearly, this is an issue. I mean, I, 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 th I think that's very, uh, very clear that um, uh, wealth matters. Um, and in fact, there's a paper by John Lott in 87, Journal of Political Economy. I wrote a reply. Uh, his argument is that the wealthy people get more severe sanctions because what he argues is that they have to spend more money on lawyers to get away. Um, but, you know, the problem is if not getting away as the poor people were more efficient than my rational choice, the wealthy would not spend so much time on the lawyers to get away. So there's an issue of what we call in, as you know, in economics, revealed preference. Because if, if John Lott is trying to argue the wealth, the wealthy are more punished than the poor because they spend so much money on the lawyers and the poor don't spend so much money on the lawyers, my argument is a revealed preference argument. Yes, that's true. But if the welfare of the poor would be higher than the welfare of the wealthy, the wealthy could basically have the welfare of the poor. They, they would just not hire lawyers and get convicted like the poor. If they don't do it, it's because they definitely think that spending money on the lawyers and not getting convicted is better than spending no money on the lawyers and getting convicted. So there's a revealed preference issue here. That's why I think John Lott is wrong when he tries to argue that the wealthy actually have more severe sanctions than the poor. It works in a mathematical model, but I think there's some arguments there that's w why the model doesn't capture uh, reality. Okay, so we have about 10 minutes. Let me try to wrap up here uh, while I leave for the next session the issue of rationality and some other, and some other issues. Um, Becker model insights are we should have severe sanctions and low probability. The reason being that sanctions are cheaper and probabilities are expensive. So we should have more severe sanctions, fewer police, fewer judges, fewer prosecutors. Why don't we see this? We don't see this 
because there's a bunch of arguments explaining why this would lead to inefficient policies. First argument, or first group of arguments, marginal deterrence. If we had very severe sanctions, then people would not be deterred from committing more serious crimes because anyway, they're going to pay a lot of money or they're going to jail for anything for a long time. So that's a bad policy. Second policy, people will try to avoid these very severe sanctions. That's corruption. Example, second example, avoidance activities, trying to make the system more expensive. Third uh, sort of uh, arguments has to do with this false negative, false positive reasoning. If we're going to have very severe sanctions and very low probabilities, we might end up convicting too many innocent people to too tough punishment. We do not want that. That would be a bad balance of resources. And of course, the last set of arguments is some of the things we mentioned throughout this session is notions by the community, by the judges about the enforceability of these sanctions, right? I mean, it's not very difficult to see. Imagine, imagine a world a bit like what the British had before the 18th century, where essentially you either hang the person or you acquit the person. There's nothing in between. Either death penalty by hanging or acquittal. What's going to happen is that a lot of the judges are going to acquit people who committed minor crimes because they don't want to convict these people to hanging for some stupid minor crime. So it's going to undermine the whole policy if you think, you know, if this were the ideal policy. So we don't want very severe sanctions because this might not reflect the preferences of the community, call it fairness, call it community inclinations, or even the preferences of the judiciary, right? Judges also have some priors and they might not want. Now, granted, in the United States, as you know, unlike India and, and, uh, and the UK, because you have had some sort of um, criminal codification much earlier, in the US there was not a lot of criminal law codification for a while, and so they needed this sort of what they call sentencing guidelines. But the issue of the sentencing guidelines, right, where, as you remember, this was enacted in the 1930s, 1990s, to try to restrain judges in terms of sanctions. But here's the thing, which goes to, I think, was a point that Sarah raised in one of her questions. If you don't have sentencing guidelines, Precisely because the judges have so different views about the appropriate criminal sanctions, you might end up with a huge variance. And what's the problem of the variance? The problem of the variance, it's going to undermine the community trust on the criminal justice system. Because if you see people convicted for the same crime having very different sanctions, a huge variance, then this is a problem for credibility. So the sentencing guidelines, the idea was that they would not sort of change the medium sanction, so no effect on deterrence. The medium sanction is the same, but they would try to sort of close the gap and so sort of make the variance smaller, right? And so the argument was no effect on deterrence, but again, in terms of credibility, in terms of prestige, with the community because you don't see people being convicted for the same crime to all these um, um, differences. Okay, I think I'll, I'll stop here for questions. Uh, if there are no questions, no worries, we'll have more time next time. Go ahead, go ahead. Question. 
in you know the blackstone concept of uh, false positive and false negatives um is it the you know is it is it a static concept that uh, it will be too costly to you know uh, yeah i mean i, I, or, I don't think does it take into, think... you know there's a, there's a, there's a consequence of Acquitting of many also in terms of a you know dynamic of context. So, I don't I don't think Blackstone, I mean I don't think well Blackstone was not an economist, right? I don't think he was concerned about the dynamic effect. I think I don't even think that he probably was concerned about the ratio being 10. I think he was just sort of giving the intuition that we should have a more a pro defendant system than what England had in the 18th century, right? Which it's presumption of innocence, it's the prosecution that has to prove the case. So the burden of proof is on the prosecution, not on the defendant. Now, I, I think that's what it means. Also, um, remember the specifics of England in these days. Some of you might not know. Judges in England until quite late in the 19th century, I think it was the same thing in India during the, the, the 19th century. Um, they were paid a percentage of the award to the plaintiff. They did not have a salary. So this creates a pro plaintiff procedure. Because if, if the judge, well, the jury and the judge acquits the defendant, the judge doesn't get paid because you pay the percentage of the plaintiff's award. And so I think the problem they had in England in the 18th century, it's unlike France or the German states or the Italian states, they had a very pro plaintiff criminal procedure, which means a lot of people were convicted, a lot of innocent people were convicted because the judge wanted convictions to get paid. Um, and I think that's the scenario. You have to sort of understand the context where he's talking. Like, I don't want this. We should have a more pro defendant um, procedure. But I don't think he had any theory on, on why we have that. Okay. So this, I see. Can I ask one question? Yes, yes. So, so is, is type one and type two are the same, like what you have discussed about the false positive and false about that? Is it the same thing right? in statistics with what we discussed? Yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> it's, it's, it's the same thing. Some people call it uh, type one and type two error, but usually for our lawyers, false positives and false neg negatives is a, 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 better, a better jargon. Because not everyone is familiar with the, the statistical concept, but it's the same problem. It's exactly the same problem. Okay. Uh, I think this, why, yeah, why is why, yeah, but last question from my side. Uh, why are economists so concerned about, you know, the whole idea of efficiency as far as punishments are concerned, the cost of punishment, fines being, you know, a, 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 both being a good trade off or a balance? Because Factually speaking, resources are really not the constraint for a state. Uh, I mean, if have... if in a financial meltdown or COVID there can be trillions generated, so in this yes, case also. But the clearly, clearly, Renita, you're talking from India point of view. You need to be in the US. We hate governments. We hate taxes. So resources should be very constrained to the government. We do not want governments with unconstrained resources. So I, th I think that's why economists here think this is a big issue because the criminal justice system is very expensive and people pay taxes to finance that criminal justice system. Um, so I, I, I think people here but, would but disagree. Can't with the criminal system. justice system be financed uh, in any other way than taxes? They can be, you know, um, just a lot of printing of more money to look into a new policy directive with regard to. Oh, now you're getting into the monetary financial. policy. 
uh, then you get into the then then you're going to go to Milton Freedom. You don't want to print money. We don't need to print money. So I I, I you know I, I understand your point of view. Um, and in fact, I don't think criminal justice system in Europe is a significant burden on the government finances. But I think in many states in the United States, it is. Um, remember, um, in California, the system of public jails has increased 37 times more than the universities in the state of California in the last 40 years. That's the proportion. So that gives you a sense of how this is really, really a big issue on the burden. That is, the criminal justice system has increased 37 times more than public ed education. This is just absurd. Uh, but this is, this is, I mean, I'm not going to get into the details of the US as you all know, because they put a lot of people in jail. Um, the problem that they decided on the war of drugs, that anyone who had drugs had to go into jail. So that's, you know, that created a huge problem here in terms of costs. But I, th I think in a lot of states, this is a serious cost problem. It's not just, you know, one minor issue. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Okay, there's someone here. Let me just read the last question, the last comments here. Um, Yes, yeah, so, so some of this is, is some of the issues I, I mentioned. I mean, um, uh, of course, you have cultural context and you have specific, you know, different social preferences. Um, and so how you design your criminal justice system has to reflect social uh, preferences. And so I don't think let me put it this way. I think doing the cost benefit analysis is universal, but I don't think the costs and the benefits are the same in every jurisdiction or in every country. Because here's the thing. If the benefits and the costs were always the same in every country, then the existing criminal laws would be the same in every country. And the fact is we have very different criminal law systems across the world. Now, putting aside the political economy issue that it could be an issue of political economy, obviously, but putting aside that, the fact is, it is very likely that we have different social preferences and different social costs and benefits from doing these things. And that's why certain policies will be observed in one country and not in a different country. Of course, the issue in India as a big country as the United States or as Canada, is the extent to which in big countries, you may have very different views about the social costs and benefits in different parts of the country. And that's what I think is the challenge in big countries like India or the United States. It's very clear that the social preferences concerning crime in California and New York are quite different from Texas or the Midwest. And so the question is, how do you define, design a criminal law system that handles these very different views about proper way of handling crimes? Right? U.S. is a bit easier because federal criminal law is very limited. Uh, if you centralize criminal law as somehow countries like more like India or um, European countries, then, of course, you have an issue about how culture and how different preferences should be aggregated. Okay, I think I'll stop here. I, I, I think you guys have to stay in, in line for some other housekeeping discussions. So I'll, I'll see you uh, next week, I think on Tuesday, right? Same time. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, sir. So just we'll take a two three minute. I hope I am audible. Yes, sir. You are. I, yeah. Uh, so firstly, I think uh, 
I think I'm getting a great response in the chat section. People are, I think, uh, alert with that. But no, sir, it's not that you have to put in chat. You can unmute and speak. So, and by the way, we could not uh, initially told that there is a uh, there is a best discussion uh, uh, certificate will be there. It's like those who are participating in that some of the best may be chosen, I think, and that will be taken care by our Ayush and Anita Madam. So they are uh, attending the session. So hopefully, uh, uh, so that information is aligned to you because that should not happen only Sara and Bridges and some of the colleagues. It is uh, a faculty also. <laughs> ah, why not? But faculty then, <laughs> I think you are the judge, so I, I think you have to exclude it. You and I both has to be excluded. Otherwise, all others are fine. Even Vivek is also fine if it's participating. Uh, so that that is about the symmetric information. So, uh, uh, but it does not happen that you put everything in chat and you just only unnecessary killing time of the uh, some of your colleagues. So I think if you make a meaningful uh, communication, that I think will be great. Otherwise, that... also, sir, I mean we should have the ye on na, your what is this called video video. video, video yeah. <laughs> Because if you are there, who is Sarah? We don't know who is. Uh, uh, I think I can. I'm. I'm grateful that uh, uh, Rohan Tas. I think if I'm. I, I don't know if I correctly pronounce. I think Sir has on, and I think. Rotash, Doctor Rotash. Dr. Rotash yeah, thank Dr. you Dr. very Sir much. Was, I think. Uh, and we should uh, have the uh, videos on, please. You know, yeah, it just I looks think, like a class, and there's yeah. better interaction. Please. And I think I will be happy to meet Rota sir as in when he arrived GNLE because now I can I know him personally through through video I think so sir, some I, of I, sir, sorry to interrupt sir good evening ma'am good evening sir I sir visited uh, GNLU in the March I attended the uh, workshop Land Economics Conference I presented sir I was in the conference Thank you great so much. great 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 to have you for that. So, uh, similarly, I think what Madam has said, if you can uh, on your video, I think that will be great. Uh, so that uh, even uh, when, as in when uh, Garnu Garupa sir meet you, I think he can know you not through your name, but through your face also. <laughs> because they know us, but I think important is that if they should know you. <laughs> because we have worked for the last 10, 12 years and we have done many things, so jointly they are knowing. And I will be, I'm also thankful to some of our colleagues, uh, but the NLU's colleague who have joined, I think uh, it will be better if uh, they can also be uh, equally enthusiastic with regard to uh, this thing. I think that will make uh, even session more uh, a different skill. Now, I, 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 I want to talk about the assignment. So assignment is also incentive, nothing more than that. Uh, we don't want a day to day reflective note. So either you can prepare a 500 word of reflective note uh, or better, maybe you can also go with abstract. So I will suggest you can make a 500 word of abstract because there is, I think, Madam may tell, there is one other conference which uh, IL is organizing, Indian Association of Law and Economics, and I think deadline is 15 July. So if you are interested to contribute paper, I think even uh, this assignment you can submit as an abstract there. Uh, but we are not telling to submit there. But if you are interested, then you can think about. But for here, you have to submit around 500 word of abstract as a assignment. Now, question may be that whether you have to submit in criminal and constitution. We we may restrict, but I think it depend upon your interest and depend upon your uh, 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 specialization. I think uh, this uh, may be slightly relaxed. Possibly, if you can do that, is better. But suppose you have specialization on other areas, so you, the tools are remaining same. You can use this tool in other uh, discipline also. So uh, I think Ayus will send you a link just uh, uh, before the end of the session. I think our session is getting end on I think tenth uh, uh, August. So I think if you can submit uh, by tenth August that find the word of extended abstract or reflective note, whatever you find. Reflective notes are nothing but whatever your learning is there in the class. You can uh, com compile that and you can submit. So this is what uh, we want to say. So two, uh, two announcements, one uh, with regard to the uh, mass discussion. Hopefully some may be uh, there. There is no monetary price, but we'll give a certificate. Uh, next time we'll make sure that we can also introduce a monetary price. So I think some other additional incentives are there. Uh, and other, uh, uh, there will be uh, with regard to, uh, thus you have to submit a 500 word of abstract. And I say that is also incentive if you're interested in law and economics world. 
I think the, that this is the best conference which is coming uh, by Indian Association of Law and Economics. I think uh, I will uh, I will share the, I use that link and you can also if you are interested you can also submit paper there. If you have any query, otherwise uh, this was from my side. If Madam want to say something, Madam can uh, say. Yes, I want to say something. I want to at least see the participants today. Can you please make yourself visible? Hello, good evening. So good nice evening, meeting all of you. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, ma'am. Hello, good evening. Good evening, ma'am. Yeah, so can we have this uh, presence, your presence, digital presence for all the sessions? It makes that session way more lively. Yes? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So sure, from tomorrow, from tomorrow, this is what we will expect. And a lot of interaction, please. Um, and uh, interactions will help you formulate uh, your uh, abstract, the extended ex abstract that Dr. Tucker has spoken about. And those abstracts can be worked upon, developed for the next conference that is coming up. So we have an outcome oriented uh, session for you. Hello, Pragyat. It's so nice to see you. Hello, ma'am. Yeah. Hi, Suha. Okay. That's it. I think it's quite late, 8.40, uh, dinner time. And uh, good night. Thank you so much. I'll see you again tomorrow. Thank if you, you have any you. concerns, please reach out to us. You know, your reading material has been sent. If anything beyond that, please communicate with us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Thank Tucker. You, uh, Ayush, Vivek, all the participants, all faculty friends from other national universities and all participants from uh, GNLU and other than GNLU. Hello, Vivek, you are in deep thought. I have a very bad network, ma'am. I'm trying to struggle to keep oh. my video on. Ma yeah, that's a common problem. All right, then, good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night, night. Good night. Good night ma'am.